Hey everyone, I preached a message last Sunday that I believe can be a message for everybody, not just for that local church. So I'm posting it here and I think it can be a blessing to you. So enjoy. Hallelujah. What a joy, what a privilege to speak here. Uh, we've been uh, just privileged to be part of Capstone for some time. My wife Emily and Eleanor is up there somewhere praying that I will not make a fool of them. <laughs> And uh, we're just thankful, and uh, we, we've met the Lord in this place. And uh, what makes a good church is the presence of God, right? That, that's all. That's what we need. So we're really honored and really thankful. So let's pray, and then I'll share what I believe the Lord put on my heart. Yes. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you once again, and we thank you. We thank you that you are as real as the bread and the wine we just took. We thank you, Lord, that you're not just a figure of somebody's imagination. You are the reality itself. And, Lord, we thank you that you're here by your spirit. You're here to have a word for everybody who's here, young and old. Lord, for those who might not yet know you, you know them. And, Lord, for those who walked with you for a long time, God, you know them as well. You know us. And, Lord, we invite you to just come, take control, do whatever you want to do. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So about 10 years ago, I've been a minister for a very long time. I, I grew up as a PK. My mother is a pastor. And I decided that was the last thing I want to do. And here I am. But uh, so about 10 years ago, I've been ministering for a long time. I was running two Bible schools, one in Sweden. I was serving in a, as a pastor in Sweden. I was running a Bible school college in Kenya. Uh, just, you know, moving on with life. We, we were married. We were having two kids. Things were on the outside going very well. And after some time, I realized something had changed in my life. I had been used to have the smile of God on my life. If you know what that is, you know it. If you don't know what that is, get to that place. Just you know that somehow God's face is turned towards you and you sense his smile. Yeah. I was used with that. I, that's how I tried to live my life. But that something happened where I started to sense that I was no longer seeing God face to face. I started to see him in profile. Somehow I had drifted from the Lord but I had not done anything different. That was my problem. I had not done any great sin. I had, you know, I'm a normal person or a human like anybody else, but I was not falling into sin. I had not done all that kind of stuff. I had not compromised. I was serving the Lord. And still, I had drifted. I started to feel like my passion was running out. It's like, you know, holding some sand. The, the, the harder you clinch it, the more it runs out. So I started to do more of what I always do, right? I started to do more prayer. I, I, I went to the same sermons and preachers that usually inspire me, but my heart was strangely cold. I went to the same books that usually, you know, ignite me, and I was not fed. Wow. Yeah. I started getting really worried. Yeah. What's going on? Is this like a midlife crisis? I heard about that, but no. This is something much deeper than that. So I really started to seek the Lord because I, I have been taught my whole life, right? If you're in trouble, what do you do? You seek God. Right. So I started to seek the Lord. And the Lord put me in a process that has transformed my life. And what I started to realize in this process is that I was not alone. That I see that, the, I put it this way, that the gas in many Christians' engine is running out. The gas in their faith, if you know what I mean by that. They're, they're running on fumes. So they try to fill it up with the same things they usually do, and it doesn't work anymore. And you can get really worried. Where do you go? You know, I mean, I'm doing all the same things I did before, sensing the smile of God on my life. I'm doing them now and more of it, and I'm not feeling that anymore. So the Lord brought me on a journey when I realized that what I needed was what Jesus says in Matthew 6:33. There he says this, and it might come on the PowerPoints. He says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first what? His kingdom. 
So what I started to see was that I needed a renewed understanding of what the kingdom of God is and what it means to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. What I started to see was I needed to put my focus not on the present but on the future. I needed to see that to confess Jesus means, of course, that my sins are forgiven, that he died on the cross for me in past history, that he was resurrected, but it meant that his resurrection will become mine, that his resurrection is now my future, that no longer is I, I'm just to live for the present, I'm to live for God's future. I'm to orient my life for God's tomorrow. When I started to see and I started to study, I started to wrestle with these things, I saw that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Azusa Street in Los Angeles, about 100 something years ago, the revival that has you know, spread around the world, the charismatic Pentecostal outpouring, I started to see that those people lived with a passion for the kingdom. Those who study, you know, this early movement, these revivals, they're saying that what defined them was a passion for the kingdom. Wow. Can you say that? A passion for the kingdom. Passion. Taste it. Do you have that? Do you, could, could you honestly tell me, Michael, I do have that. I have a passion for the kingdom. I could tell you that my crisis of faith was that I really didn't have a passion for the kingdom. I might have a passion for the church. I might have a passion for missions and other things, ministry. But my passion for the kingdom was not really there. And I came across somebody who told me, Michael, you can't drive a car only looking in the rear view mirror. Wow, that's a revelation right there. What? He said, you can't drive a car only looking in the rear view mirror. We can't, well, of course, we need to look back at the cross. We need to look back at what God has done for us. But we are future-oriented people. We're living for God's future. We're heading for the resurrection. We're heading for a new heaven, new earth. We need to seek first the kingdom of God. We need to look through the windshield, which is our future, which is the coming of God's kingdom. So I came across a scripture that really shook me, and it's Paul. And as I'm studying Paul a lot, and, and, and I'm, I'm a teacher of theology, I'm a professor of theology, so I had to teach a lot, right? And uh, right now I'm teaching online in, in a Swedish seminary college, and I torment my students with a lot of things and scripture and theology and things. And I was wrestling with the life of Paul, and I came to see that this man was a man who lived for God's future. And I came across a scripture, and if you have time, read all of 1 Corinthians 15 today or tomorrow, because you will see the future orientation of Paul's faith, and of course the Christian faith. But here, 1 Corinthians 15, this verse just struck me like, I don't know what, like lightning or a ton of bricks or whatever. It says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. What is Paul saying? So when I spent some time wrestling with this scripture, I got, I got a shock. Because what Paul is actually saying is that he has invested so much in God's future that now if there is no future, if there is no resurrection, if there's no new heaven and new earth, he is a great fool. So what he's saying is, and the challenge I got was this, what kind of how, how do I live my life? What, what decisions do I make? Do I make decisions that look so foolish in this world unless there was a resurrection? But when I looked around at myself and other people, and of course I don't look around to judge, I'm just looking around. I see that many Christians, they live a pretty good life. Even if there will be no resurrection, they, they don't look that foolish. They avoid the things that make them look like fools. And we avoid the sacrifices that really are costly. Because do we really believe in a new heaven, new earth? Do we really believe that this life is sowing for the future? 
Paul believed that. That's why he was saying, I am willing to sacrifice so much that I will be a fool. I'll be the most, the greatest fool unless. But of course, Christ, as he says, Christ is risen. We know there is a new heaven, new earth coming. But I was so challenged by this man, this apostle, who had this future orientation of his faith that he was willing to self-give. Self-give, self-sacrifice, pouring himself out. This is why I believe he can say in another scripture in Romans 8, he says this, I consider that our present sufferings, so present sufferings, anybody can say amen? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, me, maybe? Yeah. Are not worthy, are not worth comparing with the glory that will re be revealed in us. What, did, what does give Paul, what, what is it that gives Paul this strength to suffer? What is it that gives him this energy to self-give and to sacrifice? It's because he's looking for what? The glory that will be revealed. That he was living for the future. He was not just looking at the present. He was not looking at just what's going on right now. He was willing to push on into the future. God had given him a vision of what's going to happen. You see, we cannot achieve that in our own. And in my crisis of faith, I realized that the only way to get that revelation, the only way to enter that worldview is the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the future. The Holy Spirit is bringing God's future into the present. So that meant I needed to seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit who is bringing the future into the present. But that's the only way. So I set out on the quest to be filled with the Spirit, to push further. And as I studied these things, I realized that, hey, wait a minute. This future-oriented faith was the power of the early church. Yeah. This future-oriented faith made the early Christians ready to suffer and to even lay down their lives. I'm very challenged by that. I don't know what you feel, but... Somebody who's willing to lay down everything, including their own life for their faith, man, I, I want that gas. <laughs> you know, the Christian, you know, in, in Kenya, they would say, what gas? You don't want gas, you want petrol. Gas is not a good thing if you have it, you know. Yeah. But yeah, so for our Kenyan listeners, I'll say, I want that petrol, you know, that, that energy, that future-oriented energy, I need that. Because I realized that to be a Christian today means sacrifice. And when I listen and I talk to, uh, you know, very mature people who are living close to Jesus, I start to hear people saying that we need to be prepared for persecution, even in the Western world. When I hear that, I'm saying, whoa, where can I get the energy to go through that? Well, the early church. Listen to what they are saying here in Hebrews 10. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is a fantastic scripture, and I'm so glad Pastor Parkey brought that up from Hebrews. But Hebrews had this, uh, what's going on in the book of Hebrews is that there's been a group of Christians. They have been de dedicated to the Lord, on fire for Jesus, giving their lives, sacrificing. But at some point, they got discouraged. They saw, the Lord didn't come back as fast as they expected. They started to feel that the sacrifices started to feel a bit too much. Anybody can identify? Yeah. They felt that, you know, I gave all this to the Lord, but hey, have I got to return yet? Oh. Ooh, this, is, this has been very costly. And, and so the book of Hebrews is written for many purposes, but one particularly, and that is to encourage people in perseverance. To keep holding on to their faith that the score has not yet been settled. One day the tables will be turned, the last will be first, and the first will be last. So here in Hebrews 10, the writer says this in verse 34, you suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Woo, I don't like that, the sound of that. <laughs> you know. But I've been cheated. Have you ever been cheated in the name of Jesus? Serving the Lord, somebody cheated you, a brother, a sister, or somebody? 
Well, maybe not, but some of us. Would you, did you do it joyfully? Did you lose that money joyfully? Have you been, oh, sorry, but have you been giving to a church or a pastor who turned out to be corrupt? How do you feel? Well, the joyful confiscation of your property. Yeah? Yeah? How do you do that? And he says, be, and he continues to say, you accepted that. Why? Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. How could they go through that life of self-giving and sacrifice? How could they go through even being united with people in prison and being so persecuted? Because they did what? They knew. They that was the gift of faith. Mm. They had seen something greater. And they, because of that vision, they had the strength to sacrifice. Moses. Is, is another one who challenges me here in Hebrews 11. And I'm just going to be very fast because I want to be uh, conscious of time. But if you continue on from Hebrews 10, that was Hebrews 10. And Hebrews 11, we have the great hall of fame of faith. The, these people who live by faith, and they describe how people live by faith in the Old Testament, trusting the Lord. And again, a wonderful chapter, Hebrews 11. I had a Bible school teacher when I was young. He says that every, pre, every person's Bible, when you open it, should open automatically to Hebrews 11. <laughs> you should read it so much, you know, so when you just flip it open, Hebrews 11. I think that's a good thing. My, I don't think mine does. Let me, let me see, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. But he's not here today, so he won't judge me. But Hebrews 11. So when we come to Hebrews 11, we come and encounter Moses. First of all, we encounter something very important, and that's faith is always future-oriented here. Faith is giving them hope to continue. If faith gave Noah the power to create something that nobody else had seen before, in the coming of a judgment that nobody had seen, faith gave Abraham the strength to leave what he knew to go where he didn't know. Yeah? Coming to Moses, look at what it says. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Today, you might think of Egypt as just sand and pyramids. And if anybody's from Egypt, I'm sorry. I think that's a stereotype of your wonderful country, right? Yeah, but when we think Egypt today, we're like, yeah, okay, treasures of Egypt. Who, you know, that's in northern Africa, probably just nothing. Well, at this time, Egypt was the biggest nation in the world. Or not the biggest, but it was the most powerful, economically prosperous nation in the world. Right. So when you're saying treasures of Egypt, you're, you're saying, boom, you're saying big stuff. And what it says is that he disregarded the disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because what? Look, at, look ask your neighbor, because of what? Just to, just to see that they're away. He was looking ahead to his reward. Wow. So in the 1960s, and we can skip to the next wonderful photo here. In the 1960s, some psychologists made a, um, an, um, an experiment called the marshmallow test. And my, my daughter, Eleanor, she speaks very English very well. So I don't know if I pronounce marshmallow. Marshmallow, does that make sense? Is it mar marshmallows or... Yeah, it's close, it's close. You, you get it. You know, this white thing you put in your mouth and you can make s'mores with it, okay? Are we, yeah, we're together, yeah? So these uh, psychologists, they made a very interesting uh, ex uh, experiment in the 1960s. You can study this. It's very known. Many of you, I'm sure, know it. At least you know marshmallows. So, so what they did was that they gave these children an option. Here's one marshmallow. You can see it, yeah? You can eat it now. You're free. Go ahead and do it. Or if you just wait a while, I don't know how long it was, if you just wait a couple of minutes, you'll get three or you get more. Yeah? You're getting it. Yeah. Either instant gratification, and that's fine, or you wait and you will get what? More candy. So, and th their test was like this, that the kids who had the resistance or th they were, you know, had, had some self-control and skipped the marshmallow, they would do better in life later on impulse control and things like that. So I'm not going to get into that. But what I believe is that we are in a cosmic marshmallow test. <laughs> really, this is Christian life. He said, yeah, you can eat it. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. But are you willing to sacrifice it? 
Because you have a vision set on the future. Are you willing to wait with, you know, things in life or even sacrifice? Maybe that, you know, that job that would pay you such a better salary. But when you pray, you don't have peace about it. What are you going to do? Well, it's a marshmallow test. You know? Are we, are we ready? I mean, you know, I have this amount of money. I can now buy the car that I really want, but I also know in need. Uh, what are you going to do? Well, you can buy the car. Sure. But if you're like Moses, if you have, and nothing wrong buying a car, you understand. I'm just saying, are, what kind of life are we living? And what, what, what vision has gripped my life? And where do I get the energy from? To make some weird choices in life that make me people think like, man, what are you doing? Turning around that, you know, turning down that scholarship that would be the dream of anybody. And you say no to that because God has called you to do something else? Man, you weird. Yeah, yeah I'm weird. Because I've been caught by something else. I'm caught by a vision of the future. I'm filled with the spirit of the future who's the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Jesus. I believe that his resurrection is mine. That's good. And now I need to align my life with that story, that narrative. Yeah? But it's so easy to get a upside down understanding of the world it's so easy the devil is so smart he makes us value things wrongly have you noticed that the whole world is working with a upside down value system so that we will start to value and invest in things that really don't have any value at all in the future now it might have have value now we that might be honorable but one day when we get into the future yeah, I have another photo which I thought was kind of funny with some nice cuddly things. I don't know if it will come up on the, the screen. Anybody get nightmares when you see this? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Should we just continue maybe? <laughs> no, I, I never did this, but I heard people invested in these. You call them beanie, beanie something? Beanie babe. Be, beanie babe. Wow, that came fast for some of you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Expensive, yeah? No, I, if I got it right, and you had to correct me on this, but I heard that people thought that this would be really valuable. So I saw an interview with a lady. She was crying. She said, I've spent my whole college savings. And she had boxes and boxes of this in her attic because they were meant to be worth more than their weight in gold, right? And uh, I, I don't think they are, all right? I mean, people really, yeah? Yeah, you, you, can, you can get this twisted belief that things are valuable or will be valuable in the future, which are not. I know you probably heard this, this funny story, and I'm going to butcher it uh, Swedish style, but the way I remember it is that uh, the story goes like this. It's not biblical, okay, but it's a funny story. So, so there, it was a rich man. He got the diagnosis that he will die very soon. So he liquidated his assets and bought gold and, and, and filled two suitcases full with gold. And he told his family, when I die, I need to be buried with these two suitcases full of gold. And they said, okay. So he died and he went to heaven and he came with his two suitcases to St. Peter. That's where it's not biblical anymore. Yeah. And you know, yeah, even the suitcases, by the way, not biblical. Yeah. But anyway, so he's coming to heaven with these two suitcases and uh, St. Peter, as the story goes, asks him, what? what? You, you brought suitcases. All right. Can you open? What? Show me. What are you bringing? So he's proudly, you know, open them. One, no. Gold. And Peter says, what? Or he, I think he says, "Wah." I think "wah" is a very helpful expression. Yeah. It's biblical. "Wah." You brought pavement? Pavement? <laughs> Streets of gold. You brought pavement. Yeah. I had a very interesting experience. Like, like Pastor Parker said, we've been living in Kenya for about five years together with my family as well, and running a Bible college there, driving, you know, not driving, <laughs> thank God, flying sometimes back and forth and so on. And I usually bring a couple of, uh, you know, maybe $30, $40 in Kenya shillings. 
Uh, you remember these big ones with elephant, the golden ones, yeah? I always bring them in case, you know, maybe there's a delay, I need to get a taxi or, you know, something. And, you know, always just a couple, you know, $20, $30, but in shillings. And that would be about 3,000 shillings, something like that. So I always have that. And those, I mean, I came to Kenya when I was young, 95. And that money has been there throughout, the same kind. And you can see that because they smell and they look dirty. They did then. So the, just a couple of years ago, I came to the airport again as normal, with the money as normal. I mean, I've been, this has been going on for over 20 years. And now I'm just going to buy a SIM card for my mobile phone, right, on my cell phone. So I'm just, you know, I want this to the safari comb, and so they give me the SIM card and say, well, it's 1,500 shillings, so I, I bring out the cash. And, say, and they start laughing and say, no, good try. And I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> you know? Is it, you said 1,500, this is 1,500. He said, no. Didn't you know that we reissued the money about half a year ago? These are worthless. <laughs> I said, really? Are you serious? Because I've been on the flight feeling really happy that I got $30 in my pocket, you know? I'm coming here, I'm ordering a SIM card, and now I'm ignorant. So I asked him, what am I going to do with this money? He said, blow your nose, or do something, frame them, you know, light a fire. He said, they're worthless. And I got this amazing insight from God. I felt, Lord, may that not happen the day I die. Coming with stuff, you know? Coming with experiences in life and my life that I lived, thinking that it's valuable. So here, Lord, is my life. And he says, but well, Michael, didn't you know that in the future, now here, this is, this is not worth anything. Where you lived before, that was really applauded and worthwhile and, you know, uh, respected. But here, no. Wow. What? <laughs> May God help us to get a vision of the future. Oh, that's what we want. I'm going to close with just a couple of short comments. Uh, there's so much to say about this. But in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul has a phrase. The, the Corinthian church was really struggling, right? They are bringing people to court. There's a lot of things going on, especially in chapter 6. I'm not saying I understand all of that, but I see that Paul makes a very powerful point. He says, do you not know that we will judge angels? What he's telling the Corinthian church is not, who's not, they're actually living like the devil. They got drunk during Holy Communion. Well, none of us did that today, thank God, but they did. And practiced spiritual gifts. What a toxic mix. You know, yeah, but that now he tells them, he's trying to straighten them up. He's trying to help them act Christ-like. And how does he do that? He said he points towards the future. Can you see that? Yeah. He, he says you need to act more Christ-like because don't you know that you will judge the angels? And when, we, when the Bible says angels, don't think about these small, you know, uh, naked boys flying around that we see, you know. Those are not biblical angels. <laughs> biblical angels are those that people fall down and, as dead or they want to worship them even though they shouldn't. The apostle John had leaned at the, at the breast of Jesus, but even when he meets an angel, he falls down as dead. These are holy creatures, and we are meant to do what? 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 If I am practicing to judge angels, if this life, and listen carefully, listen, this life is practice to inherit the world to judge together with Christ. And if I am to practice to inherit the world and even to judge the holy angels, I cannot watch that TikTok clip, or I cannot follow that influencer. I cannot have sex before marriage. I cannot. No, I can't. Why? I'm, I'm practicing for my future. You guys can compromise maybe, but I am practicing. And the way to practice to inherit the world is holiness. We have a crisis in our church, not this one. Thank God. But in, in the global church, we have a crisis of morality, isn't it? No names named. No, we don't have to mention any names. There's a battle and people are falling. 
I think we have lost our future vision. We have forgot that we are practicing. Holiness, I thought, was legalism. I thought, I, I can't act this way because God would judge me. You know, God is just waiting in heaven with a big club, and if Michael's doing something wrong, bang, he will smack me. So I need to, be, I need to live holy. No, uh 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 No, I'm living holy as preparation for the future. And I'm doing it by the help of the Holy Spirit. Oh, may God help us that we can live holy. The last thing, and I believe this is for some of you. When you study uh, the New Testament and Paul, you'll find that he was not only looking to the future as something that hasn't happened yet. He looked to the future as something that has already begun. That meant that the future has not all, hasn't come in fullness. We are not yet resurrected, yeah? But we can taste the powers of the coming age. Hebrews 6 says that. We can taste the powers of the coming age. So that means to live this future-oriented life, to seek the kingdom of God first, means that I can be open for, are you ready for this word? Surprises. Mark got a surprise this morning, isn't it? Surprises. Surprises are wonderful. And I have this amazing quote, if we can find it, from this theologian named Stephen Land. He, he is a charismatic, spirit-filled Pentecostal theologian, and he was studying the, the, the early revival in Azusa Street, all right? The outpouring, 100 year, over 100 years ago. He says this, what? Can we read it together? They were, they were living in a world of surprises and divine visits. One thing that frustrated me 10 years ago was that I had been in some bad theology before, some bad, you know, not, not so good teachings, and I saw a lot of miracles. Then I thought I, I entered some more biblical teachings, and I saw less. I thought after a year, that would change. Two years went, three years, four years, five years. No, 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 still, I didn't. That was really frustrating. But I can tell you, that this future-oriented story perspective worldview opens for the surprises and the divine visitations. Would you like that? Yes. Are you ready for a surprise and a divine visitation? Maybe you need that. I pray this morning, I felt that's a word for some of you. You look at your life and you say, man, I can't go on like this. No, you don't have to. The future can break into your present. Just make the future your goal. Yeah? You don't, live, you, don't, you don't do it to get the surprise. You get it because you're practicing for your future, but when you do, you get a taste of the powers of the coming age. And I'll pray that for you. I pray that you will be healed. I pray that you get a prophetic word when you're lost. I pray that you will see a financial miracle when you need it. But be sure that you're living in the right story. Be sure that you're not just looking in the rearview mirror. Be sure that you're living like Paul like the only church, like Moses, with your eyes set on the price. Amen. Can we stand up and we'll pray? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, we want to thank you that you came to save us from our sins, but you didn't just save us from judgment and sin. You saved us too. Life with you in your kingdom. And I pray for each one of us that you through your Holy Spirit will enlarge in our vision of what that means. May our hearts be captured by an affection for your kingdom, a passion for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.